fact, um, Lenny, can you elaborate a little bit about what Valley College does um, to help, let's say, the unemployed um, learn new skills and return to the job market? Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. What, what I wanted to just talk about, I, I talked about being creative. I talked about uh, Magdalena, the seasoned person in volunteerism. Um, and, and Cynthia was a recipient of this, too. We came up with this program called LA Fellows. We're getting a lot of people that are unemployed managers, and, and I think Greg alluded to this also, that have skill sets that are unemployed and they're not, if you looked at Dr. Blank's uh, comments this morning, is they're not getting a job from six to 12 months. If you go unemployed, it's, it's six to 12 months before you're getting a job. So what are these people doing? Sitting back and doing nothing, and they have a lot of skill sets. We started this program, and Dr. Carlio is our president of Los Angeles Valley College, and she was instrumental. We even took some words of encouragement from Marty Cooper, who has a wealth of knowledge, and it was very helpful in giving us some advice in, in uh, getting a program for individuals that have skill sets. And we put 140 hours of training, mostly soft skills, resume writing, interview skills, and how to interview in this new job market with social media and things like that. And then they have to apply. They have to interview and be accepted. It's called LA Fellows. And then what's different about it is they have to give 100 hours of volunteerism to a nonprofit. And we have 63 nonprofits in the San Fernando Valley that we have incorporated. Cynthia's nonprofit took on a couple of our fellows. And we uh, had a 100% success rate in them completing and a 70% success rate in them getting employment. So. And, and in dollars and cents, that was an in-kind contribution to our local economy of about $350,000. So we thought that was a creative solution that was funded by Greg and his organization, uh, supported by our district. So we, uh, we think that's a way. What people are doing is they want to experience a worker before they hire them. I think there's a lot of people that are nervous. They go to... Uh, agencies, which is great, you know, Manpower does an excellent job, and all the other agencies, the businesses want to date before they get married, a little bit, if you want. So by experiencing this volunteer, as Greg said, he's got five in his office. Uh, those, those weren't fellows, but we're going to make them fellows pretty soon. And, and those people, you get experience what they are as a worker, not from a resume in an interview. And we've had success. And I'd like to... Um give kudos to this program. In many nonprofit businesses, we're really mission driven and the infrastructure is almost like a stepchild. So to have IT professionals and HR professionals come and do their 100 hours with us inspires our staff and our staff learn new skills also. It's really a fabulous program. Thank you so much. You. Yes, sir. To be honest with you, the, when you deal with the politics of this city, we don't have a lot of investment behind this agency. You know, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. We are in discussions now as to uh, how we can we can rectify that situation. Specifically downtown, I took a tour recently with the mayor downtown, and interestingly enough, when you look at the folks downtown and who's who's unemployed, uh, we have to do something about it. So we're in discussions right now. Uh, but to talk about one of the mechanisms that would work for you and also something that, that Lenny and Magdalena can elaborate on, and maybe the employers don't know this, but one of the services we offer is for you to actually recruit through our system. And when you get an employee, you don't have to hire that employee immediately. We will pay in what is called an on-the-job training arrangement 
50% of the wage for six months. If that person works out, our expectation is that you'd hire that individual. If that person doesn't work out, well, we, we understand you're not obligated to do it. It is not one of those things where we're asking you to be benevolent because you get to select a person. We don't give you a person. But we pay 50% of the wage if you train that person on site. And then if that person happens to meet your expectations, then our expectation is that you will also hire that person. What better deal could you get? So before you leave, make sure you talk to Magdalena. And also that would help with you as well. If you have employers that are willing to hire your customers, that 50% arrangement in terms of wages uh, is usually an incentive for an employer to hire. don't, but you would have to have a partnership with the Work First Center. If you sat down with, um, with Magdalena, you can form that partnership now. I'm currently in discussions between one of my Work First Centers downtown and the Weingart Foundation that has 200 folks who need jobs and they actually have employers and they want to experience or use that OJT arrangement. There's nothing that precludes you from doing that. I'd like to add to that. That's a no-cost bonus. That's a, all these programs we're talking about are little or no cost. So that's for you to work at the workshop center, that's no cost to your organization or to those job seekers. It's a bonus. So it's great.
Uh, I'd like to ask you now a targeted question about that. What sectors are growing, and really, where should people be training and looking? Uh, specifically in the LA area, uh, we have seen a huge increase in healthcare funding. Uh, I think a lot of that is being driven by the fact that healthcare agencies are having to switch to um, electronic filing, electronic record keeping, and so all the processes that surround that are creating job growth. Things like data entry and admin assistance, um, coders, billers, you know, the just all these institutions that are bringing on extra people to help support that transition. Um, another area where we've seen a lot of growth is in those technical um, skilled trades. You know, and unfortunately that's where employers are having a very hard time with the fit because a lot of those hard skills, those technical skills are not there. We, we spend a half million dollars a year, the Workforce Investment Board, on actually uh, commissioning studies on the sectors that are likely to grow. Actually, LA Economic Development Corporation just finished a report for us identifying those sectors that are critical to the economy here in the Southland, just not LA. Um, and what we're looking for are jobs that pay living wages, because we don't want to make investments in jobs that don't. We're looking for industries in terms of our investment that will hire folks and they're not likely to offshore their jobs, and that is a problem happening in this country. And the sectors that we've identified, of course, healthcare, because we're all getting older, logistics and transportation, 45% of all product coming in from the Pacific Rim comes through our ports, the city's port, and of course, Long Beach's port. So logistics and transportation is a growth sector. Hospitality, we've always relied on. Uh, one of the biggest industries within this region. Security, after 9-11, and I think you're looking for security officers or whatever, uh, security is a big deal within this region. But if anyone's interested in some of those studies, we have them. Those studies are used to gauge what our approach will be in terms of our investments in workforce development. They're also used by the mayor to ascertain or determine where the investments will be in city investments and how we should invest in business growth, et cetera, within the city of Los Angeles. Yes, Mr. Washington. Well, I'll throw my two cents in. There may be others that can express uh, perhaps more knowledgeably about the online. Online is, is just not for everybody. Uh, in our experience, and we, we've gone back and forth with a couple of different type blended type programs with online and brick and mortar, and there are students who can be straight A students in a brick and mortar school, and they fail miserably in an online environment. Uh, having said that, the online environment has progressed dr dramatically. I, I, our electronics technicians, for example, associate and bachelor level, most of that work is done in a virtual world. And it's amazing. Our, our, our employers will come to us and they'll sit down on our program advisory committees and they'll say, show us how you've taught these, these students, these graduates that we've hired, and we'll show them the, the virtual electronic world that we teach them in and they, it's just amazing to them they said that that graduate came to us we put them on the assembly line and they were proficient from day one yet they never really touched a breadboard or a wire it was all virtual so you can do tremendous things in, in that type of an environment an online environment but it certainly is not for everyone the mix online is continuing to grow there's a lot of accreditation regulations that have come out a lot of federal regulations uh, there's now one, I don't even know if it passed yet, but it, they're requiring an online school to get accredited in every school in which it has students. So there's a lot of hurdles for the online world. I, but I don't know if anybody else has any input on that. Yes, Mr. Cooper. Um, I teach at UCLA, and we have meetings of our faculty, and we talk about should we move this class or that class to online. And what you clearly find is the demographic difference. 
older professors, older instructors really aren't comfortable moving to an online environment. I want to see my students in the room and I want to be able to look them in the eye and talk to them back and forth. And they're not going to change. Younger instructors, younger professors in their 30s and 40s and even 50s are much more comfortable with it. And I think we're really in a period of real change and a lot of it has to do with not just the students, but those who are teaching the students. Any further questions? Um, I have two general questions um, for any of the panelists. How can California continue to compete if we do not fund primary education for the next generation of workers? Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you use the microphone, yeah. please? Thank you. I've got one of my members. Ken, you want to stand up for a minute? He's on my commission. He's a member of the Workforce Investment Board. They've been focusing on dropouts in some of our programs because we also get $20 million to deal with young folks to try to connect them to the labor market. But in our studies on the causes of folks dropping out and the percentage of people who've dropped out, we've discovered that with all of these programs in elementary school, including kindergarten, we have a dropout problem in kindergarten. The parents aren't bringing their kids to school. So one of the commissions in the city is going to discuss that and try to figure out what the cause is because 